no. <laughs> and so it is. We'll see you later. See you at 3 o'clock for the telethon. Woo. Loving it all, really. Wow. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I'm doing a chapter 9 out of the book now. Called, it's called The Practice of Carrying Water. It's about physical labor. I feel like this has been some physical labor <laughs> <laughs> experience in this. Wow, that's, in, that's something else. Loving this book still, this Barbara Brown Taylor. It's, it's, it's just, it's turning every day, everyday experiences into, into spiritual practice. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, Johanna and I were uh, up with our morning walk this week on Saturday morning. And uh, we noticed that the gardener had come, and the next door neighbor's gardener had come with their leaf blower, <laughs> and we weren't disturbed by it because we had gotten up and we had done some physical labor. We had moved our bodies. But on other previous Saturdays, that was quite an annoyance because that was our sleep in late day, you know? And here we are realizing that this inconvenience. I mean, I even went to the neighbor and said, could you, could you have your gardener come another day? Not on Saturday, because it's bothering us. But as we turned our life into some physical activity to have a spiritual practice of body movement, that annoyance was no, no longer there. So we get to choose our spiritual practice. We get to choose what we do as spiritual practice. And when we do, then the everyday occurrences of life can sometimes not be quite so annoying. Maybe you don't need the colorful word, but you do have the breath process, the spiritual practice that he talked about, right? Yeah. But it's really interesting that our first response was, tell the guy to come another day. He's out just doing his physical labor. He's out trying to take care of life. He's trying, trying to take care of his family. But our response was move it to a different day because really in our culture, we, we don't shine too highly on physical labor. And she talks about that in this chapter. In fact, she says that in our culture, the general idea is to make enough money that you can pay other people to change your sheets, to clean your toilets, to mow your lawn, to raise your food even to raise your children, to take care of your elders. We don't look at physical activity, physical labor. Not only do we not look at it as, as a worthy pursuit, we should do something else, sit on our butts in front of a computer, although I'm excited to have people sit on their butts in front of a computer later today. <laughs> <laughs> Situational ethics. Yeah, and monkism. Uh, but the idea is that these everyday activities can actually become part of our spiritual makeup, can part of our spiritual practices. The truth is that God is all there is. God is all there is. God is holy. God is life itself. Life, then, is holy. Life is all there is. Therefore, this thing that we do in life, everything we do in life, including our physical activity, is a part of the expression of God itself. She says in the book, she says, if all life is holy, then anything that sustains life has holy dimensions to it. We like to hang our laundry out on the lawn, on the, on the line, in the yard. And it, when you see them blowing in the wind, you see the laundry blowing in the wind, become prayer flags. The laundry becomes a spiritual practice. The Zen activity of the clothespin to the line to hold the clothing and even taking it off and the process of folding it neatly and putting it away becomes a spiritual practice. It becomes something to get close to. I went to a silent retreat once. Uh, my first silent retreat. I've been to a couple since then. But the first one was up at Mount Baldy. I think I talked about this, and I was silent for a few days, and on the second day, uh, Isaac Hayes started singing in my head. 
Something in the way she moves. Great song, but not when you're at a silent retreat. And I went to the Zen master and I said, you know, we had the, 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 you know, the uh, once a day you meet with the Zen master and you could talk for 15 minutes. I said, I'm hearing, I'm hearing uh, Isaac Hayes in my head. It's bothering me. That's good. No, no, it's good. The next day we had to do cleanup. And it was interesting, my job was to do the leaves. I was raking leaves and cleaning the path and it's in silence, right? And I'm trying to gather up the leaves and put them in a plastic bag. And as I was doing this and holding the bag, another uh, retreatant came over and, and held the bag for me and I, we joined together in spiritual practice to do this without words, just in the silence of that motion. See, when physical labor becomes spiritual practice, it also becomes sweet. It becomes communal. It becomes a joining of souls in a like activity. And for the rest of the retreat, whenever I would pass this guy, there was this moment, just eyesight, boom, oh, heart connection. I didn't tell him I needed the help, and he didn't ask because he couldn't, because we were in silence, but it, it became a touchstone for us. Your physical labor becomes a touchstone for your experience of God because it's all God, it's all life. Even when it's hard, it can be that way. I was thinking about the seasons in Southern California, you know, earth, wind, and fire. And, <laughs> and as I thought back to 92 and, 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 and 94, we, we got some good shaking going on in 92 and 94. And uh, after one of those quakes, uh, I was in the backyard talking to my neighbor about the damage in the neighborhood. And we had an aftershock. And I was actually on the phone with my brother during the aftershock. And Lee says to me, you feel that? I said, I sure do. He says, eh, that's like about a 4-3, wow, like a, like a four, 4-4. Four, four. I said, I don't know. I think this might be about a 4-7. It could be close to a 5. He says, yeah, it might be because it kept rocking. You know, he says, my brother's like, are y'all all right? Because you, you're talking like it's just an everyday occurrence. <laughs> like the, the earth is shaking and you're just like, oh, that's a 3, 4, 5, 6. You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that is it. But it was really interesting, and she talks about this, how when life gets hard, she says, necessity, necessity bounds us, to get, bounds us together. It was our common language, that one that did not require words. When we're going through a situation like that, you don't require words. I didn't require words for him to help me put the leaves in the bag. We didn't require words to go and help your neighbor clean up his yard after an earthquake. We don't require words to take water out to the fireman when he's fighting the fires that are blowing on the hills. It doesn't require words to help the truck driver whose truck just flipped over on the 91 freeway because the wind toppled it. It just takes understanding that He's God, I'm God, this is a God experience. We get to share it together. So we jump into action, we jump into that physical labor. I remember the t-shirts after the earthquake. You remember those t-shirts? When, when the earth starts shaking, we come together. You know? That's what happens. Doesn't require words. Because it's a God experience. And it's all God, so it's all us. And we all become involved in that experience. In the, st in the book, she tells the story of an ice storm. They moved out into the country because they wanted the country life until the ice storm came, knocked down the power lines, 20 trees, them in the main road, so they were without power, Barbara Taylor and her husband, for about nine days. You know, she says, turn off the power for a while and see if such phrases as the power of God and the light of Christ sound very different to you. <laughs> Next time we have our own earth, wind, and fire season, we can think about this when the power goes out and it's dark and you have to light candles and cook a different way and, you know, the conveniences of life become deeper touchstones for gratitude. We really say, wow. You know, how many times do you think about it? You just walk into a dark room, you just you click the switch. You don't even think about it. You know, think about all the guys that are going up on those power lines to make sure they're good, putting the new fresh poles in the ground so that your lines stay strong and secure, you know? When you go to turn on the gas on the stove, do you think about the guy that's down there at the gas at the uh, uh, re uh, distribution station, checking the, the, the various valves and everything to make sure that you are safe in that situation? When you pick up the phone and call the gas company, I smell something. Do you, do you really think about 
what's involved in that man who jumps in his car and comes to your house, jumps in his truck and comes to your house to check that out for you. These are the everyday conveniences, but these are spiritual opportunities to dive deeper into the knowing that there's just one life, and that life is God, and that life is each and every one of us. Yesterday at the service was a beautiful slide presentation of the family, and in one of the shots, one of my favorite shots, it's some of Jerry's grand, great, grand, super, lot of grand, 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 great, great, great kids. <laughs> laying in the piles of leaves and just their faces are sticking out of these piles of leaves and I was thinking about growing up in Detroit and having to rake leaves and how that felt to make those piles and how much joy there was in not the making of the piles but the anticipation of jumping in the pile after it was made you know some of you folks transplant you understand what I'm talking about you know I wonder what's happening to that my friend my mother's friend Jeanette has a uh, well, he's now six, but at three years old, her first grandson would FaceTime her on his own with his own iPad <laughs> at three years old, right? His thumbs are so fast, I don't want to play any games with him. <laughs> you know, my ego cannot take that because I'm going to lose no matter what. I was playing uh, Wii Bowling with with Johanna's brother and uh, brother-in-law and, and sister and their grand nephew, uh, Rene, Rene, and and he's just he's just a strike, strike, and I'm like gutter ball, gutter ball, and they're just loving that, you know. But that technology, they they got that. But what about just going down to the darn bowling alley and picking up that heavy ball and tossing it down the aisle, you know, down the lane? So what do we, we're, we, I feel like we might, we might be missing something in our search for convenience and forgetting a little bit about what's going on with uh, taking the easy life. Some of you aren't in the book study, so I thought I would share a piece of her writing just directly from the book. We got story time. Ooh, who saw R Mr. Rogers? Uh, what's the name of the book, the Rogers the movie? Oh, it's so good. I highly recommend you go see that. Welcome to the neighborhood. I normally don't do this, but excuse me for a moment. It seems to be a little dry today. Gulp. <sighs> this is, this is the, the practice of carrying water. You know it's time to dig the potatoes when their leaves start to turn brown. Ed, that's her husband. Ed taught me this the first time I dug potatoes with him, which I still remember with perfect clarity. I was reluctant to be in the garden. I did not want to get dirt under my fingernails. I did not want to sweat. I wanted to be indoors doing something that involved books or at least newsprint. But Ed was so excited by the prospect that I might be excited by digging potatoes that I relented just to shut him up complaining bitterly all the way to the garden. He picked up a shovel, loosened the dirt at the base of a shriveled looking plant. Dig there, he said. I gave him a withering look. Go on, just see what you can find. Well, I stuck my hands in the dirt and started feeling around. The dirt was damp and cool. It smelled fresh and mysterious. I broke clouds apart with clods apart with my fingers, waiting for something that felt like a potato. Since I could not see what was going on under the earth or what I was doing with my hands, I looked up at the trees. I looked at the leaning pines, the heavy oaks, the straight poplars, the gnarled dogwoods. I looked at the blue sky through their branches, all the while working the dirt beneath my hands. My first potato was the size of a marble, a big one, a shooter still attached to its mother by a root, no thicker than a boom straw. It's just a baby, I said to Ed. Should I leave it alone? Nope, the plant's finished. You can have everything you find. So I popped the root and put the potato in my bucket, plunged my hands back into the earth. And there was a whole nest of small potatoes right behind my first find. I dug them out, brushed them off, every one of them with a different shape. And when I dropped them in the bucket, they thumped the bottom like a small cloud of hailstones. Reaching back into the dirt, I felt something curved poking from around the hole that Ed had dug. 
Little by little, I cleared away the earth around it, drawn out handfuls of dirt with earthworms in them. My fingers were wrecked. My nails were gone. I went back in. Gradually, the curve became a half sphere. My shoulders were cramping. I kept digging until I freed a potato as big as my hand, brushing the dirt off of its yellow skin. I understood why the potato was called a Yukon Gold. I had never seen anything so elementally good looking that passed for food. <laughs> After that, I was unstoppable. Digging potatoes were like playing the slots in Vegas. I never knew what I would get. Sometimes it was change, sometimes I hit it big. <laughs> the gamble was half the fun. The exhortation was the other, the exertion was the other half. The difficult physical labor of drawing food from the ground. That night, when Ed and I sat down to a pan of roasted potatoes with Jerusalem artichokes and whole garlic, I hurt so badly I could hardly lift my fork to my mouth. When I did, I ate the whole day. The fragrant dirt, the blue sky, the dying potato plant, its golden offspring. I had never tasted anything so nourishing in all my life. Right? See, that's why I fell in love with this book. Ernest Holmes says, every man and woman must pay the price for that which he receives, and that price is paid in mental and spiritual coin. Where is your mind? What is it focused on? How are you spending your spiritual coin? And are you willing to allow the physical labors of your life to, in, to, to invest the physical labors in your life to get that spiritual coin, to get that reception, to get what comes from digging in the dirt, perhaps wrecking your nails. You see, in, in, in the lovely uh, interpretation, it's also, this book's also great on uh, those of us who are curious about the Bible but haven't really dived in deep. She talks about her studies of... Uh, of Hebrew and the Genesis story. I found this really fascinating. We have translated the Genesis story into God made man. But actually, the Hebrew word out of the earth, right? The Hebrew word for earth is Adama. And that that's created from that, that the earthling that's created from that is Adam. See? Adama is earth, and that that's created from Adama is Adam, the earthling. So in truth, what God did was God made a dirt person, a mud baby. <laughs> <laughs> so in the rest of the story, when we're told to till the soil and keep the earth, we're told to take care of that that is us. We're told to... to involve our physical labor with the soil because the soil is who we are. And so when we're charged with tilling the soil and keeping the earth, we're charged with keeping us, ourselves, because that's who we are. It's little wonder that the earth is so angry at us right now. We're the, we're the bad sibling. It's time for us to really look at how do we keep the earth. It's really interesting. It, it, it helped me to understand why gardening is so darn satisfying. <laughs> Unless it's how you get your paycheck. <laughs> As Dominic has just reminded us. But truly, think about it. When you're digging in your plants, when you're working your, your, your little garden on your patio, or maybe you have a bigger patch with some raised beds in your yard, doesn't there seem kinda, some kind of joy and, and sense of satisfaction in that? Or listening to Barbara Bell Taylor tell that story of harvesting those potatoes. We've all had that kind of a sensation when we've been one with the earth, you see. It's part of our journey. And that's why I love how she closes that particular chapter. That's how I'm going to close our talk today. She says, Welcome back to the earth, you earthling. Welcome home, you beloved dirt person of God. <laughs> Next time you're playing in the dirt, remember, mud babies, you're a dirt person of God. 
and so it is. All right, so let's do our affirmation. Are we ready? Here we go. Spirit within me, as me, approaches any task as soul work. Knowing my full participation also makes it God's work. Mm -hmm. All right. It's time for our healing prayer. And where's the box? Who brings the box? Patrick brings the box. This is that time when we get to know the truth for all of those who are feeling like they're moving through some kind of a challenge in their life. As I also like to remind us, if life's just absolutely beautiful and you want to celebrate that, thank you is a lovely thing to say in prayer. And we do it together in community. So if there's someone in your life that's working through a challenge where we need to know the truth or have the opportunity to know the truth for them, speak their name into the room right now and we'll begin that prayer together. I open the room for that. Michael. Coming up out of the silence, coming out of the hush in the room is the wave of spirit, the divine presence that is animating as each and every one of us. At the core of our being is this spark of divinity that shines its light through every cell and fiber of our being. <laughs> And in that knowing, there is a power. And there is a presence behind that power that is operating with a divine law that is immutable, dependable, and available here, now. So as we consciously come together in union, in common unity, in community, we step forward into the full knowing that the power and the presence of the divine is there, available to each and every person in our mind at this time, each and every person on our heart, setting an intention of wholeness and perfection, harmony, right action, divine energy flowing to bring resolution, guidance, salvation, fulfillment, joy, love, forgiveness, divine sweet blessing unexpected pleasures and treasures. I'm so deeply grateful for the power of spirit, for the knowledge of prayer, for the teaching that shows us and guides us and presents us a methodology and a way that we can touch spirit with our intellectual space and open ourselves to our heart space to allow the God space to be realized in time and place. It's happening right here, right now, this moment. Truth is realized good is realized. Love is realized. Life and health is realized now. And for that, I am so grateful that I release this word with deep satisfaction into that law, knowing it is done this moment, now, here. And so it is. Mm, so it is.